Hello and welcome to the Publicly Challenged Podcast. I'm your host, Luke Oswald, and I hope you join me on my quest for knowledge to become a better public land hunter, angler, and forager. Stick with this and who knows, maybe we will learn something together. All right, real quick before we get started on the show, I'm just going to talk about Treeline Academy. You've heard me say it. I can't even tell you how many times. Uh, Mark Livesey is treelineacademy.net. That's treelineacademy.net. Sign up. Use the promo code PC2020. Save yourself 20 bucks. Can't say it enough. It's awesome. Amazing. Most comprehensive e-scouting course out there. Check it out for yourself. Sign up. Use promo code PC2020. And now let's get to the show. All right. So I'm sitting here and I am talking to Brian Barney. So Brian, I'm going to go ahead and just ask you to introduce yourself if you would, please. Yeah. So uh, my name's Brian Barney. So I'm a, a small business owner in Ennis, Montana. I own a little construction company and um, throughout the years I've kind of established myself in the hunting industry as well. So um, just through a love for it and a passion for it, I started diving into these backcountry hunts and backpacking and um, I just fell in love with it and then started to travel around to different states and hunt different species and really fell in love with the bow and arrow and committed myself to that. And and through those adventures, I was able to share them through multiple different websites. And um, I, actually, there wasn't websites when I started. When I started, you had to send them off to magazines and get published <laughs> in magazines. So that's really where I got my start. And throughout the years, yeah, a few internet articles, but I just kept after it and built it brick bright by brick. And it, it was something that I loved. So I started out writing and I, I wrote for, um, uh, uh, finally found a home at Eastman's hunting journals. Like after I had, um, written and, and, and sent away all these articles and been published in these places, but the right fit was Eastman's hunting journals. And so started writing exclusive, exclusively, excuse me, I got to get my <laughs> mouth to work here, but, uh, I started writing for them and, um, yeah, I, you know, they asked me, I, I said, I'd like to write pro staff articles. And, and, um, he, he sent me, he said, well, send, send me some ideas and uh, I'll see if I can get you an okay for him. And I think I sent him 30 ideas the next day. Like I just, <laughs> all that hunting stuff and that, that thinking like, um, uh, uh, theorizing and, and trying to get better at it. Like, man, I just fell in love with it. So started to do that and then got opportunities in filming and then started this podcast Eastman's elevated like five years ago. And, um, yeah, it's just been a great journey. I'm just, uh, I'm living my best life for sure. Yeah, I definitely say so. It's pretty cool. So how did you, I mean, where did you grow up then? Did you grow up in Montana or did you grow up somewhere on the West coast or something? Yeah, so uh, good guess. I did grow up on the West Coast. So I grew up in Olympia, Washington, which is the Pacific Northwest. And um, so I grew up with a, a lot of hunting in my family. My dad just absolutely loved it. And uh, grandpa loved it. We'd have a, a cabin we'd go to. But the the opportunities in Washington, um, you know, they were limiting. Uh, just the, the, the time you could hunt and uh, seasons and um, lower game populations. And, and to tell you the truth, Truth, like uh, we just beat brush, you know. Like we we got after it and hiked a lot of miles and hunted really hard. And I learned some great lessons, but it it wasn't until later until I moved out west and moved to Montana. So I actually moved east, but I, I think of it <laughs> as like western hunting for mule deer and elk and bear. And there was just so much opportunity that I just immersed myself in like every facet of it. Uh, horn hunting, you know, would teach me where the bulls would be in winter range and and, and where they migrate back in the spring is where they migrate out in the fall and, and try and figure out where they bed and, and, and where they feed and find these shed horns, you know? And so that was another season and then spring bear. And, you know, I never really fell in love with spring bear until I tried to do it with a bow and arrow. And then I <laughs> fell in love with it. And it's, there's no bait in Montana. It's all spot and stock, but their numbers are condensed in the spring. But it was like, dangerous game you know it's like the blue collars dangerous game and and that's what i'm into is like i'm just a carpenter and i can't pay big money for these hunts so like i put in my own time i put in research and and uh, whether that's uh, uh, looking at maps or in person uh, scouting it during season during shed season so i just put in these t this time to learn these hunts in these places and 
and really I've been able to travel all throughout the West and just do the coolest hunts like, uh, uh, high country adventures, uh, uh, adventures for elk, just peak rut, uh, been up to Alaska uh, hunting caribou and moose up there. New Zealand hunting tar on their public lands, which is just crazy. Hawaii, like uh, I, I've just um, I I built this life surrounded about around my love for bow hunting, and and that's kind of my vehicle to travel the world and to experience things. And it it's just taught me so many lessons about um, you know the more you put into something, the more you get out of it. The and really the harder you work at something, the tougher these hunts are. Like the more they mean to you in the end, the more you you crave them when you get home, you know? So, so that's really been the journey. Grew up Pacific Northwest, moved to Montana when I was 20 and, and really have been traveling around everywhere. They'll let me with a bow for, um, since I was 25. That's pretty awesome. I've kind of come to the same conclusion. It's like the more time I have with my bow in my hand hunting, the less I lean towards picking up a rifle or a shotgun, um, like here in Illinois, it's pretty much shotgun only for, for uh, big game. But it, it's just one of those things that even this year, I, I had a, two tags that were shotgun tags, and I only went out one day. I just I, I didn't have it in me. I was already bucked out, and, and I was like, man, I'd, I'd rather have my bow in my hand. So I, I see see how that happens, and I can't really even explain it. It's just it, it becomes – like a second nature to where you just, you almost want that. It becomes like an extension. It, it's pretty kind of, it's neat. It's neat to experience that. And now really, I don't even gravitate towards the shotgun tag. I don't even know if I'll get one next year. Yeah. Um, it is magical. The flight of the arrow. Like, uh, <laughs> I, I love hunting and all hunting is fun, whether that's rifle or shotgun, like it's all action, but yeah, eventually it seems like my skills had progressed to a point where, you know, and at least out West, you know, the, the hunt ends at 200 yards with the rifle and it's just beginning with a bow. And I, <laughs> I fell in love with like trying to get close to him and then just how intense the experience was. And so while I gained a lot of experience with rifles and, and, um, you know, and, and had a lot of fun and learned a lot. And, and my family's with rifles, my daughters and my dad and, and, um, you know, and they love it. But, but for me, it was seemed, it seemed like, uh, I fell in love with that challenge in bow hunting and, and then I wanted to get really good at it and to get really good at it was to do it all the time. And so I just gained more experience through always carrying that bow and always, it's like the more difficult path, you know, but when you put so much work into it and practice with so many arrows and get so good at it and then love that intense encounter, like I, ju- I just couldn't see myself doing it any other way, you know? So, so that's <laughs> me too, man. I just, I fell in love with the bow and I'm still like, my love just grows for it every season. You know, I like it more and more and there's just no limit to how much you can learn and how good you can get at it. It's just like, um, the harder that you work, the, you know, the, the, the luckier I seem to get, you know, which is really cool. I, I think I've actually heard you say something like that before it, where it's your output equals how, is there something that you've said like that? I, I'm pretty sure it's your output equals something, your return or something like that, that, that kind of stuck with me as far as a Brian Barney quote. Oh man. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I can't remember exactly, but I, I'd probably screw it up if I did remember it. I'm always screwing up quotes. That's like, a, yeah, that's key. I get I, the same inspiration and motivation from quotes, and I love what they tell me, and then I try to recite them, and I just butcher them. You know, it's hilarious. <laughs> But yeah, but so, it, but it really is like, um, you know, it's not all always even Steven and there is luck involved and there is good fortune, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's just been the harder I work, the, the bigger return I see on my investment, you know, it, um, the harder I work at bow hunting at every facet, the better shot I am, the better shape I am, the more map research, the more scouting, the more days hunting, the more I put into it, the, the more I seem to achieve and, you know, I'm able to, you know, I'm really at my happiest, like in the mountains and, and, um, enduring, like, uh, enduring tough storms or, uh, tough hunting, or I love being out there and doing it, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, you're a pretty high energy guy. Are you the kind that would ever sit in a, a tree stand and, and hunt whitetails? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have, you know, that's just the most effective way to do it is to ambush them and hunt in the small tracks of land. Like, 
Um, you know, you don't want to scare them off there, let them know your presence. So yeah, like it's definitely the, the, um, uh, approach or the smarter approach. So yeah, I've been out to Ohio and I sat all day sits for, I, it was at least a week. It seemed like three, uh, they're, they're long days, man. It's, it's tough. It's more of a chess match with those white tails and, and it's still, like it's a, a mental grind, like to make those all day sits. And then I've never been so so dang cold as sitting still in a tree stand. Like I, even out west when it's below zero, I get to move. And like, you know, at first I just didn't wear enough clothes because I was used to layering for out west hunting. So I definitely had a learning curve. But yeah, man, I mean, the the most of effective way to hunt, like I will do that. And I, I tend to steer away from from like those and blind hunts and do more of the spot and stock because I love it so much. But that doesn't mean that I won't do it like when in Rome have to do what the Romans do. Like, I don't try to reinvent the wheel. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. I like I take I take a week every year and I hunt whitetails. I call it my rutcation. And those all day sits, I just started doing them like within the last year or two. And they, they are tough. I, I have a hard time. I have to find little things. And the best advice I got from people was, well, they make cell phones now. Just don't make it a crutch to where you're sitting there and on your phone and miss all the deer. But it's like, I'll give myself 15 minutes of scrolling my Instagram feed or something. And then I'll take a break from that, get myself something to drink, something to warm me up. And then it's just little micro breaks in between that, that are really what carry me through. Did you find anything like that? Or what, what was your tips? Yeah, absolutely. Like, um, same, I, you know, I, I wasn't on my phone much, you know, I was trying to just take it all in and trying to experience, <laughs> but it, I, you know, I'm sure I got on my phone, but yeah, you're right. You do break it up in smaller time periods where it's like, I'd have a thermos of coffee and every time I could pour a hot cup of coffee and like pass that 10, 15 minutes, you know, it was like, just make it in between windows and tough to stay present. And man, I am impressed at those white tails, like how good they live you know, in, in, in small terrain. And what I mean by that is like, you know, they can live in the, the back of a farmer's field and get to be five years old and they get really good at living in that small space undetected. And <laughs> yeah. so, yeah, like it's a mental grind to sit in those stands and then, you know, it isn't easy on those white tails. They're, they're so switched on, you know, they're switched on species and they've learned to look up, but they, they're like any animal, they catch movement really well. And that includes movement out of a tree stand. Like you, you, you're not invisible up there, like any movement, they can detect you. And then, you know, of if, like getting into range is one thing, but those bucks, especially when they're rutting, you know, they never stop moving out there, you know, and they're <laughs> constantly moving through shooting windows and you're trying to get a shot. So it's really tough. And I really respect good whitetail hunters. Um, those mature animals, like, um, uh, they're wily. Yeah, for sure. So I was looking and I happened to see a while ago and I was looking through your Instagram feed again and you, you set a personal record for yourself this year, didn't you? As far as a uh, uh, bull elk. Yeah, yeah, I had a great season. Like, <laughs> man, I uh, a bunch of time and time with family and friends, and then able to just send it on some big adventures. And so, yeah, um, elk hunting the season uh, started off. I uh, had a couple of elk tags and and um, filled one tag on on a great bull, just these giant fronts, like 20 inch fronts, with so much mass and just a real heavy bull. It went like 48 wide or 50 wide, and um, a great dark horn bull. And I killed him with my buddies and in the mountains and like gosh, two different backpack trips, like six days of grinding, something like that. So it was just awesome. I killed that bull and. Uh, came back and got a little break and um, had my home state left and um, a couple Hawaii buddies that drew it this year. And so they were over with me. And so then we headed out there for another elk hunt. And um, yeah, I was trying this year, like he checked a lot of my spots that are usually pretty good and just wasn't bumping into the elk is elk are nomadic and they really move through country and, and they can, they can be hit or hit or miss or all or none you're either in them or you're not you know and when you're in them it's the most exciting rut craze frenzy you know that you can imagine with a bow in your hands but when you're not in them you're just traveling a lot of country and i was averaging you know 13 to 15 miles a day just trying to find elk and just wasn't picking them out and so you know, I had to change my strategy. And so go to some spots that, uh, I've never hunted before, but I've e-scouted and I've really wanted to get into. And so it gave me a good opportunity to get into a couple of those. And 
struck out in a couple and then once you know it like worked down on this deal and found this bowl and like the crazy thing about experience is um like it just teaches us and uh through experience and through all these years of western game hunting like i've got pretty good at seizing opportunities or knowing when to go all in and when to move in and when to hold back so i found this bowl and um, I found all the cows. I saw them before they saw me down in a little gut or a depression, like a drainage that went down. And um, and then the bull walked up, and he was just this great big wide bull, and he just had it all. Great fronts, thirds, fourths, tails, like just has it all. <laughs> Super wide, tall, just, you know, great one. So, so um, he had two – go ahead. Oh, I was just – you go ahead and you finish what you're saying. I'm sorry. Oh, uh, so um, – <laughs> So it was him, and then he had two satellite bulls, and um, yeah, that night I sat above him, and I tried a couple different approaches to try to drop in on him and see if I couldn't get within bow range of his cows and kind of try to make something happen with a good wind, and um, I just wasn't able to. And then right at last light, the thermal started dropping, and I tried to to go all the way around him, around the drainage over there, and as I was going around that drainage, um, there was a satellite bull down there, and so, uh, you know, a third one, and so... You know, there was no way to get in, and so I just backed out and uh, had a long hike back that night. Got back in the middle of the night, met up with the guys, and said, "Yeah, I got a good bull. I'm gonna go in on him in the morning." And and then um, cruised in in the morning and was able to find him. Kind of waited to make a play and and waited for him. You know, they started going up to their bed, and then I was just trying to coyote and stay with the herd. Like I hadn't seen my opportunity to go try to get in. You know, it's just two satellite bulls and a bunch of cows and then that great big bull. And finally I saw it went around a hip and able to capitalize and, and see my all in moment and go for it, come over the top. And he's just tailing a cow and stops their broadside and gives me the shot I've always dreamed of. So yeah, my biggest bull to date, like I put a great arrow in him, and you know, those, those bulls are so big and so tough. Like he had so much pride. He didn't want to die in sight. I gave him a perfect arrow bleeding really good, but he made it over the ridge and, and, um, so I, I gave him some time and then, um, climbed the ridge behind him so I could kind of glass down where he went and he was dead. He just, um, he died as soon as he made it over the ridge. But yeah, my, my absolute best bull to date, um, that I've been hunting 20 years for, you know, to, you know, killed a lot of great bulls, but this one is, is definitely the best. He's just got it all. The super cool, man. That's so awesome. That's, it's really cool. So as like a beginner, like myself, um, I know you do a lot of actual glassing and, and spotting and then stalking on them. I mean, would I be better off to go and try and do more calling and bring in a bull or should I still try and depending on the terrain, I guess it would matter, but, um, try and spot them up and then go in on them. Man, you, you, um, you answered your own question. Like, uh, like it depends on the cover and where you're hunting them at. Definitely more open terrain, um, it is more conducive to stalking, but you know, man, I've can, I've just committed to stalking elk. And so that's the game I play and I like to stalk them in their feeding features. And so, you know, it seems like everywhere I go, no matter, you know, like some stuff is just too thick as you can't ever glass it or get a peek at it. But for the most part, like I'm, I'm able to spot and stalk them everywhere I go. And that's in the mountains. That's in the breaks it's you know i and i just look for them in feeding features elk don't get enough feed in the timber they have to come out into openings and and that includes like thick cover of the pacific northwest they got to come out in clear cuts and alder slides and thickets where you can see them they have to feed out there you know they're a uh, four to 700 pound animal 800 pound animal and so like i i really use my glass and in feeding features and i i use a combination of vantage points but really I like dive into country and, and, and make good hikes up ridge lines and things. And I like a master vantage point, but for elk, I just really like, like uh, traversing through country and just glassing every little available opening. And, uh, I like getting in there early and listening for bugles. And, and even though I'm not calling at him, like I, I still get to hear the rut and bulls still bugle. And when I find a bull, he's not on edge, he's not on pins and needles and I'm able to stalk in. So you know, it's a tough decision and a tough call because it, it takes years to hone either one of those. And I, I definitely know calling, like you definitely call in more satellite bulls, but the, the action can be crazy with calls nowadays too. But man, I mean, I, I sure like the spot and stock game. And I think like when you, 
when you commit to it and then um, you perfect those techniques, I think you kill consistent bulls year after year, you know? So I really like doing it that way. That That's at least my preferred method, but you know, more than one way to skin a cat and a lot of people kill elk by calling them in too. So one of the things that you hear is people tend, especially on public ground, to call too much or to condition the animals. Um, what What's kind of your thoughts on that? Yeah, less is more with elk. Like I started off calling and called in a lot of bulls for myself and family and friends and things of that nature. So definitely less is more. And it's more about the location of the call and the setup you're making than it is the calls you're making. And and really reading the reaction of the bulls and trying to respond to that. But yeah, a lot of times these these bulls are bugling back and and they're really gathering up their cows and moving away. So I think it's about reading the scenario and reading the bulls like, like language back and forth and then, you know, really plotting it out where you're going to call from. And, and, and we used to do really good with cow calls and I know some of my buddies still do good with cow calls. Um, so I I think it's just, um, reading the reaction of the elk, trying to make good setups. I I would always call elk in when I get to where they want to go. So if they're heading to bedding timber, if I can be in that bedding timber, like, man, he'll come check me out or even in his travel route or where he's headed. Or if I call from a saddle and he's headed towards there, it seems like they, they just come in on a string. And so, um, I, I would do more of that than I would like chasing and calling Adam. But, um, and, and you know, there's some some other techniques too, like, like raking trees works really good. Like that'll get their attention and bring them in without even making a call. Sometimes it's the subtle noises, you know, rolling rocks and kicking dirt. So it sounds like elk scraping trees. And then, um, you know, also like, um, uh, when they're calling, like if it's a two person setup, like, um, you know, it, it doesn't hurt. Like if you're going to call at some elk, and um, try to try to figure out where their escape route is and, and have one guy head for their escape route and one guy start calling and trying to hunt them, you know. And then when they try to escape the drainage, you got your buddy up in that saddle where you know they're going to leave the drainage and, you know, he might get a chance too. So I, Elk's just all about thinking outside the box. But I would say it's like reading the – reading the engagement level of the elk that you're calling at for sure and less is more. For sure. What's crazy is you just mentioned the escape routes. And I just had a guy I was talking to and he actually told me, and this was for whitetails. He's like, if you're using public land and all these guys think that they know where these big bucks are bedded and they're going to get right up on them, find those escape routes, set up on them. And if you've got to sit all day, eventually somebody's going to push one and one of those big bucks is going to get up and go out of those escape routes and you're going to have success. And I was like, wow. It just, it was like a light bulb. I never thought of doing something like that. Normally it's, you know, try and pursue them where they are, not where they're going to escape to or something like that. But that's, that's solid advice. I mean, I I never, I don't know why I just never thought of it. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely outside the box thinking, you know, for like escape routes on those or mule deer and it works in pressured areas. And a lot of times hunting areas, you just figure out where, how animals move through country and where they escape to and from. And we have a a mule deer saddle too, that's miles back. And these deer always escape this basin out the saddle. And so that's how we'll play that game. You know, whether it's me stalking them or a buddy stalking them and the other guy will go to that saddle. And, um, yeah, I mean, I, I wish I could tell you that we killed a deer off that saddle, but we've been dang close. I think there's been a couple in range and some swirling winds and, and who knows, maybe even in, in, uh, a, a missed shot or something. But yeah, I mean, um, that, that escape route or just like theorizing and thinking outside the box, like, um, our biggest asset as humans is, is to be able to outthink our quarry. And that doesn't always mean like stalking it where that elk's feeding. It's like, really picking your time to go in, like seeing where he beds, where he feeds, you know, seeing like an opening, trying to get those consistent wins. It's like, um, same, same as it is whitetails. It's like this total chess match. And you, you, you know, once you locate a bowl, you know, you got a, a hundred decisions to make. And, and if you get them all right, like you may arrow that bull, but if, if you make one wrong along the way, pressure him the wrong way, get the wind wrong, make an approach where the winds are swirling, like 
there there's a hundred different chances to make the right or wrong decision and it comes down to instincts and experience but i mean that's the game that's the game i love to play and when i'm immersed in that like trying to kill a mature bull that i you know that i really want to get narrow in like it's so fun to just um you know try to try to theorize and think and come up with how i'm going to kill this elk and really like it's, I kind of like to dog them and spend time with them. The element of surprise is so key. And so with the element of surprise being so key, I never want to call at them because they just like, once you call at them, they're on edge. They just know, you know, something's going and sometimes you can slip in and you're part of the herd and you're, you're part of the whole deal and it all works out. But like this year, I mean, I, I went into this location and I was in the mountains and I had hiked in and I glassed over and man, I glass is good, like six point bull. I think it was six by seven or something. And he's got some cows. And so I start working that way. And as I keep glassing, there's just elk all over. It's just a little super party in there, you know? And there's, gosh, I think they see like two or three good six point shooter bulls, you know? And, and so I start working down this ridge and I'm, I kind of spotted them early afternoon. So I got a ton of time. And, and as I get over there and I'm just getting close and starting to close in from down the canyon, there's two guys that are on them before I'm on them. And it's, you know, it's public land, but these guys' tactic is to go up and call at them. But I'm on the opposing hillside. Now I'm stuck. I don't have a move to make. You know, I definitely don't want to screw up their hunt. My only deal is to back out of there. I got to go find different elk. But, you know, I'm here now. Let's see what happens here. And I can watch him go up in the timber and start calling. And I can watch all these elk go on edge. And I watched him chase all of those elk out of there and they had a decent win. They were just up there calling at them and these elk had just played this game before and they were all out of there. So a hundred, 120 head he chased out of there, three shooter bulls, a bunch of other raghorns. And so, um, all of a sudden, like, uh, those guys are game over, but I'm still, now I'm in the game. They headed up the drainage, like, uh, across from me, away from these guys, and they start covering miles, and so I just used my fitness, and I was able to get behind the ridge, and, man, I was just able to jog and coyote that herd and stay up with them, you know, and I could stay up with them two, three, four miles until they just went back to being elk, and now they're wallering down in the bottom, and now they're moving up to this big flat. And, um, man, oh man, I, there was a really nice, like 320, 336 point, beautiful ivory tips. And he was all mudded up from down in that bottom. And, uh, I was able to cut those elk off at last light and that bull came by me and I had all the cows in bow range and I had that bull and I drew on him once. And, um, he, he gave me like the little quartering toward shot and I just don't like it with elk. It's like, gotta be perfect. Even though elk are big, gotta put a perfect shot. And so I passed on the shot they walked up and then they met up with another huge herd and it was this super party of bugles like i don't know must have heard a thousand bugles that night you know just all up there doing it but you know my point is is that they elk know those sounds and they know when it's not natural and they get out of there and those bulls were up there bugling and glunking and i got stuck at 200 yards up on the big top up there and and couldn't get any closer. And then, so I just bailed off the ledge and then I slept there that night and all I could hear was just bugles. And I mean, watching them at last light, they were posturing towards each other, couple different shooter bulls that I'd, that I'd kill from this group. And then a couple from the other group. And it was just crazy rut action, but it, you know, like that element of surprise is just so important with those elk. And so that's how I keep that is by being quiet. And then, you know, kind of adapting to the situation. I, I go get into elk, but just never bust them. Just never let them know I'm there. Just never stalk to failure. Never go across that opening. Just always try to catch them first. And it seems like the longer I play the game, eventually I get a shot, you know, and, and we followed that group all the way around the mountain for the next couple days and, uh, found other elk and then, had to go out and resupply out of food, out of water, came back in and then ended up arrowing that, that good bull on that backside over there, you know, quite a few miles in, but, um, man, yeah, it was awesome. I love hunting elk. <laughs> That's awesome. So for those listeners that don't know Brian Barney that well, he's like a mountain goat. So when he says he actually chased on those <laughs> coyote, those elk and stuck with them, he probably actually kept up pace with them, which <laughs> Unless you're a superhuman, you're probably not going to do. <laughs> but also, with that being said, it sounds like, I mean, that because that's one of my biggest fears, Brian, is like, as a beginner, first off, you're, you're just kind of, you're, you're wanting that, that encounter, right? That interaction. And then once you have that, of course, it would progress and it would be closing the deal. But I think one of my biggest fears is, is getting on them 
and then somehow blowing him out of the valley and having to start all over again. Man, that's all our fear. It is like, man, I mean, they're so tough to find. And then, yeah, you don't want to blow them out of there. You want to play it right. But, you know, there is being too passive, too. And to kill an elk, you just got to go get into him. And you got to go get into him and then let your instincts take over, you know. And and also, I mean, there is a time to hold back as well and watch him and wait. But for elk, gosh, I mean, for me, I just got to go get into him. I got to play the wind right. I got to rely upon my instincts and – um you know, and, and I fail a lot and spook a lot of elk over the years, but eventually you get pretty good at it. And, um, then you're able to make good on these encounters and the bull I killed, um, I, I actually spooked him. So I was up on the, we climbed the top of this mountain that was, I, I don't know, maybe 11,000 foot is way too high for elk up there, but they had rounded the hill. And so we actually thought we were going to get on some elk and then, um, I think they made it all the way up the drainage. So anyways, we end up on this vantage point at night and uh, spot some elk. And so my buddy Robin's interested in this bull over on these these elk and there's a play on them. And so he goes for those. I stay on the vantage point. And as I start glassing around, I pick out this bull down below me. And uh, God, he's like lopsided. And, and he doesn't look very big on his tops, but then I see him like, uh, give me a wit shot and I can see his fronts and they're gigantic and watch him stand up. And I'm like, man, that is an old bull. And he's big. The bull ended up scoring like 330, uh, 329, I think is what he went, but he, uh, stood up and it was like, man, that's a bull I want to kill. And I ended up dropping down a shoot that night and he had some cows and working into him in the timber and uh, just playing it right like I'm telling you like moving really slow like elk it's all about speed and there's a time to run like when I was keeping up with those elk and then when you get in close you just move in like super slow watching your footfalls just creeping in trying to catch them first and I caught that bull and he was working down through this deal and, um, man, I was trying to get a range through him through these trees. And then same thing, that bull steps out and he steps out and he's right in my range. I've got a good range on him and he's quartering towards me and he sits like quartering towards me, which is just the worst angle for, for elk. Gosh, I, we had a stare down for 10 minutes. I mean, the encounter lasted down there 25 minutes. He didn't know I was there, knew something was a little fishy. And then he kept walking, walked through my shooting lane and then got over and got into my bad wind. It blew up. I blew him up, blew the cows up. They all spooked. So that was my hunt. I had, I ended up sleeping right there that night, sending Rob a message and said, Hey, I went down for this bull. I'm down in the bottom and he's over the other side, over a drainage. He chased those elk, never got a chance at him, got pretty close. And, uh, so, you know, I had to sleep there that night. And so the next day I just start rolling country and elk have a flow through country. They're nomadic and they keep moving and, and they'll go for a while and then they'll go back to be an elk. And so, you know, I really wasn't planning on finding that bull again, you know, but it just happened to be that that's how it happened. You know, we kept rolling out, ended up, uh, hunting elk that night. We got into some different ones. We dropped down with Rob on some elk and, uh, we got close to this six point, six point was like 90 yards. We had cows closer than that, just in them snuck out of there that night. And we're back in this super party, a couple drainages over from where we were, you know, and, and, um, and, and then we hunted that morning or, um, and I think that's when we had to go out for supplies, but we hunted the morning, went out just a ton of miles, made it to the truck refilled all our water, all our food. And it was just like, man, it's fourth and gold. We're just in elk. We just got to get back in there. And so, and then we crushed it and made it back in there. And, um, when was it? Oh, it was that night. I saw that lopsided bull. And, uh, uh then the, the next morning, uh, saw some elk behind camp and so sent Rob for those. There's a nice six point in there. And I was really after that lopsided bull, but I'd seen him. This is the third day I had hunted this bull or seen him or tried to get close. And, um, you know, that was the day I was able to work into his cows, backed out at one point and then saw a cow kind of cross down below me. And then all of a sudden I see that bull and he's below me and by himself. And man, I've kept my wind right all day, able to creep right down into range and kind of use the topography of the hill to kind of come up. And he was looking over his cows, had no idea I was there and put a perfect arrow in him. So, yeah, man, I mean, it, you, you end up failing a lot. And, um, it sucks. You don't want to spook them, but eventually you just got to go all in, you know, it's like, I, I just, I hunt elk aggressively. I don't hunt them passively. And when you bust them, it sucks. You got to go find more, but it's, it's just the game. I think, I think you've actually mentioned that to me or told me is you got to be aggressive until it's time to actually be patient, something like that. 
Yeah, that's exactly it. And like when I'm going on a stock, it's adapting to the conditions. And so I'm on a stock, sometimes the wind will change. And now I've got to back totally out there and try to circle around these elk a different way. Or a lot of times I'm working in and then there's a satellite bull or a cow standing there and they might catch a little movement and stare in my direction. And then I'm stuck frozen. And man, I've been stuck frozen for 45 minutes where the herd's in a perfect position. I could kill them, but I've got this one elk that's looking at me. That's going to give the whole thing away and just waiting for him to roll to a different position. And so that's what I mean. Like coyote in the herd is just staying with them, trying to keep that element of surprise and then when you see an all in moment, when you know you can kill that elk, like your whole mind and your body will just be screaming at you, go kill that bull now. You know, it's like, <laughs> at least for me over the years, like I just, you know, it's like a coyote them, stay with them. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm keeping tabs on the wind. How can I get close? Can I do this? Can I do that? And then they roll over a rise and I'm like, oh, now I can't see, you know, now's my time. And I go for it, you know, and, and th those are those all in moments and they don't always work out, man. I spook them too. Um, but, but my goal is to never spook an elk and my goal is to slip in there and then get in close to the herd and let something happen. And, and a lot of times that, that bull will, will push around those cows or like I say, thinking outside the box too, like trying to get in front of elk, like, um, trying to see where they're going to move and get to where they're going to go. Like I told you on that 320 ivory tipped bull, like those elk, I was able to run around that ridge and then able to see where they were going to come up and get in front of them, you know, and then have them pass right by me. Like I never had to sneak up on them. They just walked right in front of me, you know? So there, there's some of that, that, that happens too. It just getting in close, keeping the element of surprise and then elk just walk around and move around, you know? And so then sometimes you, sometimes you get lucky. <laughs> So do you, do you ever use like a decoy or anything like that? Do you ever play that game or no? No, I haven't. No. Um, I think they work good in the right scenario when you're calling to give an elk behind you, something like that. I think they'd work pretty good, but now I just fall in love with like the getting close game. Like I, I committed to it a long time ago. It was like, I can, I can hunt any animal during any season across the world if I learn how to spot and stock effective, effectively. And so like, I've really committed myself to learning that and getting better at it and getting better at my craft. And, um, you know, I still fail, but, uh, I've got a lot of confidence in my skills and like, I know it, I know it'll work out and I know I can make it happen. And I kind of know the rules now. It's not, such a gray area. I know black and white, how much noise I can make, how much movement I can, how much cover I need. Like I've, I've made all these mistakes. And so I've got this like whole catalog of information of right and wrongs that, that, you know, I don't consciously always think about, but it, you know, it, it's in my subconscious decision-making and in those hunting instincts. And so, man, I just rely heavy on those. And, um, like I say, I still make mistakes, but, uh, eventually I end up getting it right. So man, I just love it. So can, can we talk about that then? Like as far as making noise and when's the appropriate time to, you know, make the noise and how much noise versus, you know, I, obviously if you're trying to stalk in or something, but I guess maybe in some cir circumstances you might want to make noise while stalking in if it's in the timber or something like that, right? Where, where that bull might actually get up and pique his curiosity. Would that be like a, the right scenario or, or how would that go? Yeah, I think uh, making noise when you're doing calling setups, when you're really trying to sound like elk. And I know walking through the timber, sometimes like an elk herd can be moving through the timber and they just think you're elk. But I don't think you purposely want to make that noise as you're moving in, as it draws their attention towards you and can they, they can blow up. And I don't really chase them into their into their bedding zone. Like if I can follow them in there and I can see them, I'll still make a play. Um but, but a lot of times, like I, I want to hit them in transition or I want to hit them in their feeding feature because they're out in the meadows and I can kind of keep tabs on all their heads. When they get in that timber in a herd dynamic, they bed down, but you've got these 20 different heads of elk looking in every different direction. And unless I know exactly where they are and where my approach is, I tend to like wait. So if they put away in thick timber and they're not rutting like crazy in there, like I'll just sit on that timber and wait for them to come out in the evening. Yeah. And as far as noise, like, um, 
man, it's like, uh, you know, the more wind noise there there is, the the more noise you can get away with. The farther you away, are away from elk, the more you can get away with. If you're using topography and you're a drainage over and there's a ridge in between you and elk, you can get away with quite a bit of noise. Now, when you're above them and in earshot and you're within 100 yards, if you snap a stick or roll a rock, you're going to get their attention and they're going to look up and at you. And so, like, what I mean by that is, like, just knowing what that right speed is on elk. And sometimes like you're jogging to try to keep up with them when you're on the backside of a ridge, they can't see you. They're on the move. You're trying to move with them and see where they're going to bed or, you know, you're trying to maybe cut them off. And so there's a time to run. And then like when you're in close or when you're slipping down on them in the open and they're feeding around, then it's the time to be on your butt and like be scooting down the hill with your bow on your lap and keeping your eyes on all those elk and making sure none of those heads are looking in your direction. And then you slip down another yard. Hard. And then you look at their heads and if anything turns in your direction, just stay frozen. Animals, they don't pick up like sometimes they can pick up your silhouette, but they see movement over anything else. And so a lot of times if you just hold still, you you know, that elk will forget about you, go back to feeding or she never saw anything in the first place. Like they're ungulates. And so they're constantly putting up their heads and looking for danger. And so sometimes you feel like an animal's looking right at you. And he's looking through you. Like I, I shot a buck at 12 yards one time that picked up his head and looked right at me in my direction as I had my bow right in front of me. I thought for sure he was going to see me, but he looked right through me. I didn't move. And so like over the years, movement is key. And so there's a time to do that where you're slipping down on your butt or there's a time when you're really getting close and you're that last 10, 20 yards, you know, where you're, where you're going to poke up at 40 yards, of those elk, like that's when you need to go your slowest and your quietest. Don't let them know you're coming. Don't rustle the grass. Don't make any sound. But when you're 200 yards out and there's a ridge in between you, you can't move slow. You got to move ground and keep with those things. And I, I've seen these scenarios, like I've got a buddy I was hunting with this year and we had this, this giant bull that we were trying to cut off. And he was working like this edge and, um, and then we were right on the, like, uh, like on the, the border of the private land of where we could hunt. And we had been dogging these things on public all morning long. And we got to this hilltop and these elk were kind of scattered down there. Um, and they were kind of feeding around. And so this would be a time to move faster. My buddy chose to crawl. And so he was kind of sliding down and I waited right there and let him crawl up and make his play. But he crawled up and all these elk just fed by this knob and fed to that fence line. And then, you know, we're we're already crossed when, you know, we were well 100 yards inside that public ground to where if he just would have stayed low and then moved quietly like that, he, he probably would have shot that bull right down there. Now, I don't know that, you know, that can be the wrong move as well. But that's like an instance where he should have moved faster and moved slower. And it like um, he didn't have to crawl like I, I move as high up in the terrain as when elk can see me. And so if I can see elk, I know they can see me. And so what I mean by that is like sometimes you have to duck crawl like we used to do in wrestling where you're shooting a double leg takedown where you duck crawl. And now my eyes are below the skyline and the elk can't see me. And then sometimes you're so co close to the skyline that you've got to be crawling or maybe even dragging your belly across the ground. But in this instance, we had this ledge and we had all this cover and you're going to expose yourself over that rise, whether you're crawling or whether you're walking. And so like when he left me, God, he had plenty of time to close in and shoot that bull if he just would have gone slow and quiet with his feet and really watched his footfalls. But instead he like crawled in and I think he had cacked his halfway and he's picking that out of his hand. And it's like one of those moments where it's like now to now's the time to go close the deal, cut them off. They're in the perfect spot right there. And, you know, it didn't work out on that bull or whatever that time. And who knows if it would have being more aggressive, but that was like an instance this season where, you know, should have moved faster and we moved slower. So it's like all about the speed and kind of like knowing what you can get away with and what you can't. Yeah. So one of the things I kind of want to, you, you talked about it a little bit, but so when you find those bulls that are, or the herd and you put them down in the timber, are you trying to make, like set yourself up a little bit better? Cause you, so you try and look at it like a, your windy app or something and figure out where the wind's going or going to be going and then put yourself in a little bit better position to, to make a move on them when they do come out of the timber back into that feeding ground or, or are you just kind of making your move as they come out? 
Yeah, that's a good question. So yeah, um, yeah. So I definitely want to put myself in striking position of them, but like for me, I want to try to keep my eyes on them or where they're going to come out. And and I will set up for an ambush like that if I have the wind right, where I'll scoot in, and then I'm trying to play where I think they're going to come out. But I'll tend to do that like like later in the afternoon or in the evening. Like I don't want to sit in there all day and just have my wind in there all day, even if it is pretty good. And so, like, I'm definitely going to go try to get in striking distance to that meadow or get closer where I can see that meadow, maybe get on the far edge of it where I'm keeping my wind out of there, but I'm across from it and I can see the elk come out and make a play. So, like, I think you're right. I think it's like trying to get closer and get into striking range or trying to keep an eye on them or where they're going to come out. And and then if I am going to set up for an ambush, you know, I'll get in there like like right in the afternoon, you know, later when I think they're going to come out of that timber and I'm sitting in there with a good wind waiting for him to come out. So, um, I, you know, I'd say it depends on the scenario. But, yeah, I think it's good to get yourself in striking distance, get yourself closer to him. And and sometimes you get closer and like I don't follow him in the timber very often, but sometimes it's more open than I think. And I get over there and then I see the elk. And if I can see their bedding positions and where they're at you know, then I may make a plan to like kind of work in and above them, you know, with a good wind and try to get them that way. And so like, again, just trying to like coyote and stay like within striking distance without like getting too close and giving myself away. Yeah, for sure. That's then, like I said, that was my biggest fear is, you know, getting in too close on them right away or something and trying to, and just blowing them out. You know, I guess that's something that comes with probably at bats, you know, experience and, and, you know, learning from your mistakes too. Man. Uh, yeah, it does. And, and like you say, like, you know, I've messed up every way from Sunday and that's like how I learned these different situations or scenarios. And yeah, you just, um, you definitely don't want to spook them. But in the end, you just got to get in and hunt them. So, yeah, I I like to get that inside striking distance. But, man, I mean, I've also, gosh, I've watched, like, um, I hunt this one spot that I backpack into. And I saw a bunch of elk working it. But you got to hike, like, 13 miles around this spot to go get into it. So I hiked all the way around. And I I looked down in this drainage. And all the elk are filtering into this timber draw. And I'm kind of across from them. And I'm watching oh, I don't even know, 100, 150 elk, like late season, bunch of good shooter six points. And I'm thinking, man, I got all day with these things. And, um, you know, the the wind was just wrong off that ridge and dove down in there. And pretty soon I spooked every one of those elk out of there that I'd worked so hard to go get into. So like it happens, you just make mistakes or you get in too close and you end up busting one in the herd. But yeah, it, it is just about finding them and then trying to get in, trying to hunt them and kill them and spook some along the way, um, try not to, and eventually just get it right, you know? So yeah, um, it's tough. There's, you know, I know exactly where you're at and it's, it's, um, it's tough. You just don't want to blow them up and you don't want to blow this opportunity, but by not wanting to blow it, like, um, you don't realize when the seize the moment at time is either, you know? Yeah, for sure. So with, with that being said, then like, would you say to somebody that's a new hunter, you know, like myself for elk hunting to try and just get myself as many at bats as possible and try and put myself on as many opportunities or try and find, you know, bulls and, and wait for that moment to get on them? Or would it be more like, Hey, there's, you know, some satellites hanging around too. try and put it on them first. Or what would be like, you know, the ultimate easiest scenario for, for a beginner to try and, you know, get as many at bats as possible. Yeah. I think find elk and go hunt elk. Like I just, um, find them and then just go try to get into them and make something happen. And I very rarely, like, I don't sit on elk for days and don't make plays. I mean, usually if I find an elk that day, I'm trying to work in and sometimes I back out and I don't let them know I'm there and I get to hunt them the next day and I keep playing the game. And the longer I can play the game, uh, the, the better my chances of success. So yeah, like I just find elk and I, I just go put yourself into a position where you can get into them and maybe they disappear in some timber chasing them in that timber. Isn't the right move. 
but wait in, until they come out in the evening and then they come out in a meadow and you can kind of read their reactions and get close and use the cover of the timber. Try to make something happen on those things. Try to get in close and then, you know, sometimes you get held up at 100 yards or 120 yards. Like the, sometimes they just feed into you, you know? And so like I just play that wind and yeah, I, I'd get those at bats you're talking about. And like that's, you know, my buddies that, that are really good hunters that, um, but some are new to elk hunting. Like, man, they just get at bats. Like we just, we traverse that mountains and we, when we find an elk, they want to shoot. It's like, well, you know, there's, there's a bull, like, gosh, go get into him. See if you can make something happen. And, and sometimes you, like, you don't want to stalk to, to failure. You don't want to go over there and blow up that elk. So what you do is you go over there and you just try to play the game. Just try to get as close as he'll allow you. Try to keep your wind right. Just try to keep everything right and get as close as you can and give what, you know, take what he'll give you. Like, um, and, and then when, when the giving's over or you don't see an opportunity and you're stuck at a hundred yards, you, you stop and you watch that bull and you let him feed into the next opening or over the next ravine. And then you go over that next ravine and then you try to find him over there, you know? So yeah, man, I just, I'd find elk and I just start getting plays at him, like just trying to get into him. And I noticed that around our public lands, like, um, you know, that, that the calling too seems to be a crutch for guys is they just work around calling at these elk and, and kind of hear some responses here or there, but you know, they, they don't really know what the elk are doing in country and they're not really targeting exactly where the elk are, but when you're glassing and you know where the herds are and you know where they're at and where you're stalking them, it seems like you have like such an edge on the competition. Like I, I'm just able to get more plays on elk and get closer and not let them know I'm there. So, man, that would that would be that would be my advice. It's just go hunt those those mountains and when you see a bull, just go take what he'll give you. For sure. So, with that being said, would would you want to just do as many over the counter type hunts? I mean, you, I always kind of struggle with that because obviously like Arizona, you know, they've got massive bulls and some amazing you know amazing hunts that you can do but you need a ton of points or you or new mexico you just get super lucky but at the same time if i'm putting all my eggs in that basket it's one of those things should i be buying you know like an over-the-counter in in montana or, or doing like a colorado every year just to try and you know obviously just get on them and work them yeah i mean um I think so. Like, I, I think there's a lot of great hunting to be had out there in low point units, over the counter units. And for me, I, I look for bigger elk populations. You know, I want there to be a lot of elk around. And usually when there's a lot of elk around, I can find big ones. And, and it's amazing. Like, you know, the, the bulls that I kill are coming from over the counter tags, you know, there, there's good opportunity there. And it's about building your elk hunting skill to a level to where when you do get one of those really good tags, you know, then you can, you know, uh, target some of those, those bigger herd bull, you know, those ones we all dream about down and through there. But unless you have the hunting skill, even in those good units, those bulls are just not easy to kill, you know? And, um, so, so I would definitely make yourself a hunt plan and I would include both. I'd try to hunt elk as much as you can. And, and whether that's, you know, once a year, once every other year, I'd kind of have a multiple year strategy or multiple year plan where you can apply for places, maybe get lucky in New Mexico or, you know, be building points in Arizona. And then, yeah, I mean, the over the counter opportunities, you know, the, um, you know, once you build a few couple points, go to Wyoming, you good over the counter. Idaho has big populations. Montana has great populations, Colorado, so, um, yeah, there's good over the counter hunting to be had out there. And that's not to say you buy an over the counter and you're insured and in killing a, a smaller bull. Like a lot of these over the counter units are units that when you build your hunting skill, you know, you can kill 330, 350, 370 bulls on these units that, that are over the counter units. And so, you know, I think it's, I think it's about elk hunting skill, building that experience and, and, um, elk hunting as much as you can to gain that experience. And, you know, you are traveling a long ways to elk hunt. And so you want to ensure it's going to be a good experience. And I mean, I guess that's the deal is you don't want to get an over the counter tag and then show up and you don't find an elk for nine days and, and you don't really get your price of admission. You put all this money, time and effort into it and there wasn't very many elk in there or too many hunters. And so you didn't get a quality experience, but I would look for the, 
the higher populations of over-the-counter units, I try to hunt elk as much as you can and just make it count. When you come out west, you know you know it's a good unit and you know that you're going to be able to turn up elk and have a positive experience. And, and maybe you don't always kill one, but you know you're going to get into them and be able to to shuffle the deck and have a chance to go make plays on elk and, and uh, maybe make something happen. So, yeah, I think that'd be the best approach for you is just to, to try to mix and match those. For sure. That's kind of, it's funny you mentioned that because that was my first experience is I didn't really have a plan, bought the tag, went there, had the hunt, didn't even see any bulls. It was like day five or six, maybe even seven before I even saw any elk. And then <laughs> next thing I know, it's time to turn turn and burn and go back home. So I totally get that. And that's, I mean, like for instance, Mark Livesey and the Treeline Academy thing he's doing is, is like, that has definitely helped me and 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 to be able to establish a plan and try and attack that plan and be able to work that and find them. I think that's that's probably going to pan out pretty good um, as far as that because, like you said, I mean, spending that money and going out there and doing that it sucks when when you just you feel like you didn't get your experience and and really I mean it's your own fault because you didn't put in the time or the effort to try and figure it out a little bit so. It's, it's pretty exciting to see hopefully what comes out of it. Yeah, they, there's really good hunting to be had out west, but it, it does take research. And, you know, this public land game, I mean, it's a bit of a gamble, too. You know, it's like you're right. If you put in the time, you put in the effort and you, you learn these units and pick the right units, you have a great experience. But, you know, there's also a bit of risk and a bit of gamble to it, too, where, you know, we we don't know all these units intimately and and to learn new places means we have to venture out and have to explore and um, you know I have pretty good odds and pretty good luck with my um, process that I use for finding units and scouting units and um, trying to find good populations and things but uh, even I strike out here and there but that's that's the difference I mean if you pay for an outfitted or a guided hunt you know you're you're counting on the knowledge of that outfitter that guide to put you into animals or to have good property they that he hunts and being a public land hunter we don't get that guarantee and so what we have to do is be explorers and um you know part of the game is exploring new country and every once in a while we strike out and i've struck out i've struck out all the way across the country 20 hour drive and not been able to find critters because maybe the the migration didn't happen or maybe it wasn't that good of a unit in the first place like who knows you know so (laughs) like even i strike out and that is part of the gamble and the fun of this whole deal is the entire process is the adventure, but I'm with you, man. Like nothing, nothing burns me more than going on a hunt and putting so much effort forth and you don't even find the buck or you don't even find the bull or like the opportunity wasn't there. And, um, I mean, it, it does happen, but if you put in the time and put in the research, there is great hunting to be had all throughout the the West, easy to draw tags over the, 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 over the counter tags. And, And there's quality animals in these ones. And it's, it's really about like building hunting skill and being able to hunt these places effectively, you know, and, and it's, it's, it's amazing what you can turn up and the adventures you can go have on, on these lower blue collar hunts that we just have to learn ourselves. but there is some gamble involved. And I, I do strike out as well. You know, Brian, that's like perfectly worded. And I think a perfect way to end it too, because I, I don't think we, it could be topped what you just said. <laughs> so I, I think it's awesome. Like, like you said, just the opportunities that are out there and if you put in the work, um, but yeah, you worded it perfectly. And I think we're going to end it on that note. So I appreciate it. And thank you so much for coming on, sharing your knowledge. And uh, I feel like I've learned a lot from this episode. So I thank you. Oh, my pleasure, man. Yeah. Good to jump on with you for sure. All right. Take care, Brian. You too. Once again, thank you so much for listening to the Publicly Challenged podcast. I hope you enjoyed the show. And if you did, please subscribe on whatever platform it is you're listening to. Also, if you could leave a review, that would help us out. And you can check us out on Instagram or at publiclychallenged.com. And once again, thank you so much for listening to the show. Thank you.